Okay, it's good to be with you. Uh, we had a sound problem. We're, we're back on track. God bless you. That's our website, africawithoutborders.co.uk. Uh, check us out. Check out the work that we do as missionaries in Ghana, me and my wife. And here you have uh, PayPal. You can support us if you want to support me and my wife on mission. Uh, everything that you send is used to help uh, the work of preaching the gospel and helping many, many children and youth that we, we support. That's the website. That's the PayPal. On the website, you can also, there are other ways to support the work as well. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to read scripture and uh, get into some of the things I wanted to share that I think might be an edification and a blessing to you. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're studying this at the moment uh, here in Ghana. So uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you, peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the prayers of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which is proposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him in whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who worketh all the things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the prayers of the glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the prayers of his glory. So let's pray and uh, ask the Lord's blessing. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your love. We give you the prayers. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for your mercy. I pray that this video would be edifying to your people and encouragement to your people and a strength to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to talk about uh, a number of issues tonight, uh, various things that have been, uh, been studying and that have been on my mind. Before that, I want to just share my latest concerning my mother. Uh, as you know, my mother is seriously, critically ill, and uh, my family have stated very strongly that I need to come to UK uh, because it might be the last time that I see my mum. My mum uh, has been doing okay the last couple of days. Uh, her breathing has stabilized, uh, but I still will be in the UK next week uh, to see my mum, and I'll be there for a few weeks. Uh, to help look after her because my father and my brother and sisters uh, are, are very much drained at the moment and they need some help. So please continue to pray for my mom, continue to pray for my family. My dad is seriously ill. He should be in hospital, but he won't go in hospital because he wants to help my mother. So we value your prayers. I know you're all praying and I really appreciate it and I felt your prayers. And I really, really thank the Lord that I'm part of a body because I feel the presence of uh, the fellowship of other brothers and sisters that care for one another. So I really thank you all for that. And today we did evangelism. Uh, 
I went to three universities today, uh, Winneba South University, Winneba Central University, and Winneba uh, North Campus. Um, we shared the, the word of God to the students. And then we went to the market. I gave some tracks to a market lady who's helping us to do evangelism. And then we went to the main police headquarters in Winneby and we went to talk to the police and we gave them Bibles and they were very enthusiastic. We had lots of police officers come in to talk to us and uh, that was good. Then we went to uh, the fishing community in Winneby. It's a very, very stronghold of idol worship. Uh, they have a festival once a year and they worship the idols at this festival. It's a very, very dark place. We went there uh, today. We started to witness and um, I, this chap was talking to me in his language. I couldn't understand it, but I, I kind of got the drift that he was saying, get back to your own country. A lady, a, a Ghanaian lady there, I, I said, what's he saying? Uh, she didn't translate for me. I said, could you tell him that I'm married to a Ghanaian? Just to let him know that, you know, I have legitimate reasons to be in Ghana. Anyhow, uh, within seconds, as the lady translated this, he started punching this lady and she she had a baby on her on her back. She was she started to run away. He was chasing her, punching her. We all me and other Ghanaian men and some of the men with me and boys with me, we, we rushed to help her. But it, it showed you how volatile it can be at the fishing village. And there's a few videos of us ministering to the children on YouTube channel and Facebook, uh, if you want to look at that. But please pray. A lot of seed has been sown in the villages, in the schools, in the universities. Uh, we've sown a lot of seed and pray that that seed will bear fruit to the glory of God. I was wondering, Lord, what should I do in the morning? And I just was reminded of the parable of the sower. And just to keep sowing the seed and be faithful. So I've been faithful. So that's the work. So let us talk about certain things that I want to give my thoughts on some things. And uh, I hope it's an edification and I hope it's a blessing to you. Um, one of the things I want to say is uh, Tim Keller, uh, the minister, died. Uh, Timothy J. Keller, who was the founding pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, co-founder of the Redeemer City, um, and the author of several books, died at the age 72, May 19, trusting in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. He is survived by his wife and three sons and three wives, and sisters and, and seven grandchildren. I, I just wanted to give my thoughts about uh, Tim Keller. <clears throat> At the beginning of his ministry, I was quite enthusiastic about Tim Keller. I kind of really liked him at the beginning. But then uh, some years ago, I read one of his books on apologetics. It was a kind of mishmash of Van Til and um, kind of until and kind of presuppositional apologetic come evidentialism but uh, I was thoroughly disappointed when he was talking about creation he was not standing on six-day creation it came across to me as theistic evolution and at that point I lost my respect for him that that that's put it bluntly and I think that there's too much of this in modern reformed and evangelical circles where the standards are, have slid theologically. That some things that conservative evangelicals would not have accepted 30 years ago are being accepted today, like theistic evolution. For example, the Westminster Confession, the 1689 Baptist Confession does not endorse theistic evolution and yet we have reformed people and we have evangelicals who accept theistic evolution and it's not on 
it's just not on. I know people say, well, a day can mean more than one day and whatever you, but you know, the word day is used thousands of times in the Bible, and most of the time it means a day, 24 hour day. Okay. I was reading uh, Philo the other day. You know, Philo lived around about 50 AD. On his commentary on Genesis, he talks about creation. And you know what he talks about? Six day creation. So even Philo interpreted Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 in a literal way. And he was very much for the allegorical method. And yet he interpreted Genesis 1, 2, and 3. What's the importance of that? The Jewish culture of that time, the way they understood Genesis 1, 2, and 3, they understood it as six day. The Bible speaks thousands of times the word day, and it means 24 hour. So whether you look at the Bible or whether you look outside a Jewish outside the Bible into Jewish culture, you get six day. The the, the issue of theistic evolution is important. There is no, absolutely no evidence whatsoever for the mechanism of evolution. Hear me out now. There is no evidence for the mechanism of evolution. Okay? When, when we look at rabbits changing into bigger rabbits, we have evidence but when we see rabbits changing into other kinds other creatures just just for a silly example a, a rabbit turning into over hundreds of years into a kangaroo is just a load of nonsense we, we don't see any of that evidence and so there is no when we talk about evolution i'm I'm not talking about rabbits can get bigger, smaller, black, white, chickens can get bigger, smaller, etc. I'm not talking about that, right? I'm talking specifically about in over history, so-called billions of years, millions and millions of years, that these creatures, small creatures change into bigger creatures, bigger creatures into bigger creatures, whatever, right? There's no evidence for the mechanism so when you go to the archaeological evidence, when you go to, uh, when you say there's a pit down man and this man and that man and different different um, school, uh, schools you're looking at, you're interpreting that data according to a mechanism that you have not proved. So by definition, you're shaping the evidence to your bias, to a mechanism that you've never been able to observe or prove. And that's the nail in the coffin. That's the end of the debate. There's no debate to add. Once it's established that you've never established the mechanism, it goes without saying that you're interpreting any evidence according to a presupposition that you've not proven in any shape or form, period. Okay? That's the death now. And you, and you can say to me, oh, uh, you're biased. No, 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 no. You're making a proposition that evolution is correct, it's scientific. So now you have to prove the mechanism. And you can't prove the mechanism. It's never been proved. There's no data, there's no evidence to prove that mechanism. Natural selection and mutation, that that mechanism produces the wide variety of the gene pool that we see in the world with all the animals and human beings we do not have any evidence at all for the mechanism, okay? That's why Karl Popper said it's not science. That's why other uh, atheist philosophers uh, also have questioned concerning evolution, uh, whether it is science. You know, Karl Popper, he, he said it wasn't science, and he had a lot of pressure put on him by many uh, secularists who were angry with him and so he reneged and he said no it is science and then on his deathbed he realized he, he felt guilty that he wasn't true to his colors and he came back to the point that 
it is not science, that evolution is not science. And it's not science. It's not rooted in any observable facts concerning the mechanism. The mechanism. Natural selection and mutation. Period. End of debate. He says, just forget the debate. It's end off. Okay? And the, the problem with the, the many of these scientists is they're elitist. The arrogant elitist people, very often, who think that the average person needs to shut up and not question. And because they hide behind their chemistry language, biology language, their professional language, they they hoodwink people because people think, oh, they must know what they're talking about because they sound so intelligent. But the reality, when you scratch, when you get down, when you get down to it, and you say, look, write on, on the wall for me the, the, the kind of, the mechanism. Write on the wall the mechanism for me so I can understand it, how it works, and the data and the evidence that you present it. And all you'll get is verbiage, verbal verbiage, word upon word of word of semantics, and you'll be accused of being unintelligent, you don't know the science, that's their tactic. You don't know the science, you're not intelligent, you're not, you're not able to think, you're not able to understand. So, okay, 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 all right. You're the one who's a scientist, you're the one with a PhD, so give me the data, just give me the data, and the data won't come. Instead, they'll like attack you and say that you're a liar. They'll attack you and say that you're a fundamentalist. They'll attack you for all sorts of reasons. We say, okay, 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 okay. You're the one with the PhD. You're the one that's an expert in biology, uh, evolutionary biology, so-called. Okay, so just give me the data. And you won't get the data because it's never, ever been provided the evidence for the mechanism. So those who go to archaeology, those who go to the bone structures of animals, those who go to bone structures of um, in, inter, intermediary uh, species that are supposed to be half human or whatever, right? You're interpreting that bone those bone structures. You're interpreting that archaeological evidence according to a mechanism you've never been able to prove Thereby you are biased, thereby you are putting the data, evidence to suit a theory that you've not been able to prove in observable, in any observable way. And that's the end of the debate. It, it's, a, it, it, it's a science of the gaps, okay? It's a science of the gaps. It's wishful thinking. And, and many scientists, many, many eminent scientists and i mean eminent many eminent scientists because they they they, they because they've been overconfident and thought you know evolution's correct many of the origin of life scientists the secularists who've tried to come up with uh, chemical apparatus that can prove uh, the beginning of life. They've come to a point of humility where many of them now are saying, it can't be done. We cannot prove even the origin of life. It's a scam. It's a scam. But yet the chemist and the, and the evolutionary biologist who, who specialize in the origin of life, many of them, will also many are acknowledging it's a scam but many also are still digging in their heels and saying they can explain the origin of life with with with, with chemistry when the fact of the matter is all they're doing is hiding behind uh, verb uh, verbal verbiage and so that's all we get from the scholars in the origin of life to the scholars in biology verbal verbiage we, we don't get any facts. We don't get any data to the specific questions that we ask. We get attack, personal attacks. That's 
the only way they can deal with it. So that, that's my thought about evolution. And so as Christians, we shouldn't be intimidated by evolution. Um, yeah, so please stand on the word of God. It's about standing on the pure word of God. Stand, don't be ashamed to stand on the pure word of God. The word of heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. The word of God stands strong and tall. When science changes, the word of God will abide forever. And yet many of you, even reformed people, have capitulated to, to the science of the day in order to try and come across as if you're an intellectual. But there's nothing intellectual about evolution. It's anti-intellectual. It's anti-scientific. There is no evidence whatsoever for the mechanism. Once you understand that, your head is cut off. Anybody who advances evolution as a premise against the Christian creationist, the moment you advance it, we ask you for the data, for the mechanism. You can't give it. Your head has been cut off. It's the end of the debate. Period. 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 And some of you atheists and some of you evolutionists out there, you might yabba, 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 give big, big words about chemistry. You might know a lot about chemistry. You might know a lot about biology and yabba, 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 with all your big words. But you know what it is with you? You're arrogant. You're so full of arrogance. You're so full of pride that if you just sat back a minute and you just listened to yourself, you're saying, oh, Jason's following the Bible. He's interpreting science according to the Bible. Listen to yourself. You ain't got no data. You ain't got no evidence for the mechanism. Remember the mechanism. You ain't got it. All right? So that's the end of that. So with Tim Keller, I lost my respect years ago with Tim Keller. And to be honest, uh, you are not reformed if you are a theistic, if you're into theistic evolution. You, you have slipped from the pure word of God into fantasy science, mythological science. It's as simple as that. So that's with Tim Keller. <clears throat> And so it, it comes down to reputation. Everybody, oh, he's a great guy, he's a great guy. And you all say, oh, yeah, he's a great guy. It's all about reputation. It's not about truth. It should be about truth, what the word of God says. Forget about reputation. It's what the word of God says, my friend. Okay. So the next on the agenda is Rudolf Bultmann. So let me get uh, Rudolf Bultmann. Me and a friend of mine, Presbyterian friend, uh, a dear brother, uh, a dear brother, let's see. Let me just see if I can get it. So Rudolf Bultmann, I got a friend, he's a Presbyterian friend, very, very dear friend, very loyal, uh, supportive, caring friend. And he suggested a podcast on Rudolf Bultmann and hopefully we'll be able to do that. But with my mum being sick, Can't find I can't find the window for it. But um I want to talk about Rudolf Bultmann. Rudolf Bultmann. Okay. Rudolf Bultmann. 
Now, Rudolf Bultmann uh, was a, a biblical scholar. Um, at the height of his fame, it was in the 50s and 60s. You couldn't get a PhD without looking into Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, I've been reading this book. It's called Christ. A friend sent it to me on PDF. Jesus Christ and Mythology, Rudolf Bultmann. I've been reading it. It's uh, seven, uh, 35 pages on PDF. And then I read also uh, Rudolf Bultmann on um, Rudolf Bultmann's Guildford Lectures on Eschatology. So I want to compare and contrast Rudolf Bultmann with Cornelius Van Til, just for a minute. So Rudolf Bultmann is this scholar who developed form criticism, which was uh, looking at uh, a verse and trying to get behind the source of what that verse is or that story is or chapter is or book is. Um, and he came up with the idea of the kerygma that the early church preached the kerygma, etc. Um, so I'm going to just give you some of the ideas that he said. One of the ideas he said that Jesus and Paul, they made a mistake that they expected Jesus to come, uh, they expected the Lord to come back uh, straight away and it didn't happen. So, you know, they got it wrong. The early church got it wrong. Jesus got it wrong. Paul got it wrong. That's number one. Number two, uh, Rudolf Bowman talked about miracles that, you know, modern man can't accept miracles. We've got to demythologize the Bible, that it's, it's, there's a lot of mythology there, and we've just got to take the kerygma, the crust of it. It's not real history. The life of Jesus is not real history. There is this kerygma uh, that was preached, the message, and that uh, we've got to look at that. We've got to make a decision. If we make a decision, to that we kind of enter into real history or super history beyond history um that modern man has come of age and he has electricity and so therefore we don't need uh this christianity that and all this mythology for today about heaven and hell and uh, those are some of the ideas that he, he had so how, how would Van Til deal with Rudolf Bultmann? First of all, when you read Rudolf Bultmann, it's very little exegesis, very little expounding the text in context. Uh, that's what I found. Uh, when Jesus uh, was talking about the coming crisis of the end times and Paul, one thought is a lot of what he was saying, the Lord was saying, came true because he was talking about um the fall of jerusalem so boltman has missed that that maybe a lot of the prophetical statements about our lord and paul were in reference also to the fall of jerusalem that's one way of interpreting and and saying no jesus didn't get it wrong paul didn't get it wrong we've got it wrong in our interpretation okay um, Van Til, so exegesis, Bultmann uh, does, does very little exegesis. Second, he imposes an idea of mythology onto the New Testament. And he doesn't look at the New Testament properly in its Jewish context, as far as I'm concerned. So this, mytho this mytho myth idea of mythology, he gets from the surrounding culture and then imposes that onto the New Testament, not really looking at the New Testament in its historical second, first century context. What would Van Til say? Well, I think one of the things uh, is Van Til would point out to Bultmann that you are using existential philosophy. When you talk about the kerygma, when you talk about the apostles, this is what Van Til would say to Rudolf Bultmann. You're talking about the kerygma. 
you're talking about uh, the the message of the apostles, but you don't believe in any historical content. So, in, in in a way, when you're saying that we have to make a decision, and that decision authenticates yourself, and and get, brings you into the um, a transcendent history beyond history. The problem with that is, Van Til would say, is you've destroyed the creature creator distinction because you've destroyed the idea of who God is because God is not behind your historical flow and God is not involved in the historical flow. Your decision is some kind of leap in the dark to experience some kind of quasi mystical historical phenomenon that you can't give an explanation for. So your whole position is empty and vacuous and irrational. And that's the problem with you, Rudolf Bultmann, because you accept some bits of the Bible, but you reject some. And when you do that, if you reject some of the Bible and accept, accept some, really you've rejected it all. Because what you're doing is, Van Til would say, you have become autonomous. You have become independent of Scripture. And because you become independent of Scripture, you are now creating a God in your own image. And that's what Van Til would say. And when you talk about the issue of science that man has grown up and we have cars and electricity and we can't believe in the miracles, you cannot account for science. This is what Van Til would say. You cannot account for science, the laws of science, with your worldview because your worldview ultimately is predicated on chance. Chance is in the historical flow is your predicate. You are building your scientific foundation in the historical flow upon chance. And so how does chance explain the laws of nature in the regularity of those laws? It doesn't. It's irrational. So therefore, when you start to talk about science and the laws of science, you're actually borrowing, Van Til would say, from my worldview, because all facts can only be explained in the context of the creator. And so the laws can only be fully understood and explained in the context of the triune God who is personal. And because he is personal, he is reliable and faithful. And so therefore those laws continue and do not break up. Whereas if you found, it, found those laws on chance, those laws do not necessarily would not necessarily continue to happen tomorrow because they're built on chance. And these are the things that Van Til would point out to Rudolf Bultmann. And uh, so he would take him down on this issue of science. He would point to him his issue of autonomy. And then he would go into some exegesis and say, you know, when you talk about the Kerygma, it's rooted in the history. It's rooted in the biblical real history. It is not just airy-fairy mythology. So when you read Van Til and you read, you read Rudolf Bultmann, it's like you're reading in Van Til a giant of a theologian and Rudolf Bultmann is just a little dwarf. He's not even a dwarf, he's an ant compared to the giant of Van Til. Uh, Rudolf Bultmann can be described his theology as pipa puff theology. It's pipa puff. There's nothing there. It's empty, it's vacuous. This existential you make a decision to the kerygma and the kerygma is not even historical the gospel is not even rooted in history it's pipa puff it's pipa puff theology pipa puff there's nothing in it there's nothing to eat to to, to study to chew to grow in when you're reading rudolf bookman but when you're reading when you're reading van til it's like you are being fed spiritual iron 
and you grow stronger by the day because you are meditating on the living God and you're enraptured by the wonder and glory of scripture. And so my dear brothers and sisters, don't be intimidated by these modern theologians that have come after Rudolf Buchner, who follow in the line of Rudolf Buchner, because they're all the same. So that's my little rendition of, there's more to say about Rudolf Buchmann, um, lots more to say, um, but he, one of the best critics of all this is uh, Rashtuni, uh, Rashtuni in his systematic theology. I was reading a few chapters, oh, Rashtuni. Rashtuni is superb in deconstructing modern theology like Rudolf Bultmann. And uh, the problem is, is during the enlightenment with Immanuel Kant, mankind lost connection with reality. There was a split, as you know, with, I think, with the phenomenal and the noumenal. The, the, the realm of reality in the physical and the spiritual realm. With Kant, that split was split wide open. A, a, a fracture was made. And so man, losing the creator-creature distinction, lost the ontological base for knowledge, the ontological base for knowledge. What does ontology mean? It means being. God is behind creation. He is the Trinitarian God is the being behind creation, upholding reality, upholding me, you, as beings with our own ontology. But when Kant split the spiritual and the physical realm, ontology collapsed, the creature-creator distinction collapsed. And because of that, man began to move away from reality, move away from even understanding himself. Reality and even humanity himself became a shadow. And you can see this in art. As you look at the history of art, you can see uh, uh, Pollock and these, these artists. You could take uh, Rembrandt, Da Vinci, very clear, strong lines concerning reality. Then you get to the modernist, you get to the monet and, and, and coming after them. And the lines of reality become blurred. The, the, the structures of the paintings of animals and humans in reality become blurred. And it's because man, in his pride, autonomous pride, not only loses a sense of reality, but even loses a sense of himself. And that's what we see in Rudolf Bultmann in his theology. It's just shadow theology, piff puff, puff, puff theology. There's nothing there. He's moved away from the God of Scripture and he's creating an existential God in his own image that is vacuous and has no content whatsoever. So that's a bit about Rudolf Bultmann and Van Til for you. So now we go on to hermeneutics. So you could read Jesus Christ and Mythology by Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, go and listen, read his uh, Guildford lectures on eschatology if you want to read, see whether what I'm saying is correct or not. Um, and also read Van Til's work. Uh, the defense of the faith. Um, so there we are. And Rashtuni's systematic theology, you can get that at Chalcedon. So I want to talk about hermeneutics. So we're going to talk about hermeneutics now just for a minute. 
the importance of hermeneutics studying scripture being careful with scripture I want to say a few things about that that you can't handle the word of god the way you want there's exegesis there's eisegesis okay exegesis is pulling out what's the eisegesis is you putting in to the text what you want exegesis is pulling out of the text what is there and you need to be doing that you need to study the bible and find out what's there you need to do hermeneutics which is interpreting the bible and uh, I want to just God and feet on exegesis. It means lead out. So some people say we don't need hermeneutics. We don't need that scripture is clear so we don't need methods of interpretation well 2 peter 3 16 there are some things in them the letters of paul hard to understand so we do need hermeneutics we do need um to understand how we interpret scripture because some things are not easy to understand yes we, a child can read the bible and understand salvation but also we need to realize that there are depths in scripture and we need ways from the Bible how to interpret the Bible. 2 Peter 3.16 There are some things in them, i.e. the letters of Paul, hard to understand. Acts chapter 8 verse 26 to 40 Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked, he answered, how can I, unless someone explain it to me? Someone needed to explain to the eunuch. We need people to study scripture, to teach it. So let us be careful that we don't talk about the clarity of scripture in a very narrow sense, in the sense that, oh, scripture is clear, so therefore we don't need hermeneutics. Yes, scripture is clear on salvation, but there are depths to scripture and we need um biblical tools of interpretation martin luther in the bondage of the will said i admit of course that there are many texts in the scriptures that are obscure and abstruse not because of the majesty of their subject matter but because of our ignorance of their vocabulary vocabulary and grammar these texts in no way hinder a knowledge of all the subject matter of scripture the westminster confession 1643 to 1648 all things in scripture are not alike plain in themselves nor alike clear unto all yet those things which are necessary to be known believed and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and open in some places of scripture or other that not only the learned but the unlearned in in any due use of the ordinary means may attain unto sufficient understanding of them article 1 chapter 1 article 7 the Belgic Confession, 1561, Article 2. Second, he makes himself known to us more openly by his holy word and divine word as much as we need in this life for his glory, for the salvation of his own. So Henry van A. Verkiller, Hermeneutic Principles and Process of Biblical Interpretation, says in page 20, Hermeneutics is needed then because of the historical cultural and philosophical linguistic gaps that block a spontaneous accurate understanding of God's word. There's some things that we need to get into and study in a deep way in order to understand. But as we use those tools, we need to realize that That we need the Holy Spirit. Okay. In order to study scripture. We need. The Holy Spirit. John 14 26. 
But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. John 16, chapter 16, verse 13 and 15. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searcheth all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but consider them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So we need the Holy Spirit to understand Scripture. So whatever hermeneutical tools we use or methods, we must understand the Holy Spirit is the one. He is the one that helps us to understand Scripture. Luther in the bondage of the will says, No man perceives one iota of what is in the Scripture unless he has the Spirit of God. All men have a darkened heart so that even if they can recite everything in Scripture and know how to quote it, yet they apprehend and truly understand nothing of it for the Spirit is required for the understanding of Scripture, both as a whole and in part of it. John Calvin, in a sermon on 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 to 10, says, When we come to hear the sermon, or to take up the Bible, sorry, the cats, money, sorry, Sorry about that. The cat wanted to go out. So the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us in our, her in our hermeneutical task. Uh, Calvin says in a sermon in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 and 10, he says, when we come to hear the sermon or take up the Bible, we must not have the foolish arrogance of thinking that we shall easily understand everything we hear or read. But we must come with reverence. We must wait entirely upon God, knowing that we need to be taught by his Holy Spirit and that without him, we cannot understand anything that is shown in his word. Wow. Uh, Klaus Runia in the Hermeneutics of the Reformers, uh, Calvin Theological Journal, 1984, says, Finally, if we want to come, to a truly biblical hermeneutic we must realize with the reformers that the word of god cannot be understood without the illumination of the, whole, the spirit of god the final key to the hermeneutics of the reformers is the confession spiritus sanctus est veris interpreter scriptura the holy spirit is the true interpreter of scripture therefore the beginning and end of all biblical hermeneutics is the humble prayer vini creator spiritus come creator spirit J.I. Packer, um, Paternoster, 1999, um, honoring the written word of God, page 147, 160 says, the characteristic procedure and techniques of evangelical hermeneutics are now before us, and it remains only to add that the evangelical way of practicing them involves radical dependence on the Holy Spirit, a dependence that is expressed by prayer for wisdom and insight before during and after the hermeneutical exercise itself. Evangelicals do not forget that sin as an inbred anti-God perversity of the soul disables minds 
from understanding God no less than it disables wills from obeying him so that divine help is needed at every stage of the process of receiving the divine message. Robert H. Stein, playing by the rules, a basic guide to interpreting. Baker, 1994, page 64, says, It would appear that what the reformers called illumination refers to understanding the meaning of the text, conviction to the attribution of positive significance to the text. In other words, the Spirit helps the reader understand the pattern of meaning that the author willed and convinced the reader as to the truth of the teaching. And again, Henry A. Verkler, Hermeneutic Principles and Process of Biblical Interpretation, 1981, uh, 2007 edition, uh, says, one attempt to resolve this dilemma on the spiritual interpretation is based on the definition of the term no. According to scripture, persons do not truly possess knowledge unless they are living in the light of the knowledge. True faith is not only knowledge about God, which even the demons possess, James 2, 19, but knowledge acted on. Henry A. Veckler, page 28. The unbeliever can know intellectually, comprehend many truths of scripture using the same means of interpretation he would use with non-biblical texts, but he cannot truly know act on and appropriate these truths as long as he remains in rebellion against God. Page 28. Um, Robert H. Stein again, uh, playing by the rules. Grand Rapids, Baker, 1994, page 71. The role of the Spirit is in interpretation is not an excuse for laziness, to pray that the Spirit would help us understand the meaning of a text because we do not want to spend time studying or using the tools that have been made available to us, such as commentaries, concordance, dictionaries, etc., may border on blasphemy, for it seeks to use the Spirit for its own ends. The Holy Spirit brings to the believer a blessed assurance of the truthfulness of biblical teaching, but it cannot be manipulated to cover for laziness in the study of the Word of God. So yes, the Holy Spirit teaches us. Amen. But that's no excuse for not studying. It's no excuse for not using commentaries. It's no excuse for not using other uh, hermeneutical tools. But yes, we do need the Holy Spirit. You bet we need the Holy Spirit. Without him, we cannot study the scripture. And, and so often it can be dead orthodoxy because we are not dependent on the Holy Spirit. But we do need to study the scripture in a deeper way. And uh, I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, I, I like this quote. If we live by the word alone, we dry up. If we live by the spirit alone, we blow up. If we live by the word and the spirit, we grow up. If we live by the word alone, we dry up. If we live by the spirit alone, we blow up. And if we live by the word and the spirit, we grow up. Beautiful quote. So, but then you need the grammatical element. You need to look at the Greek and the Hebrew when you're studying the Bible. You need to look at the literary element. Like, are you reading a poem in the Bible? Are you reading a letter? Are you reading uh, a historical book? Every genre or type of literature in the Bible will have its own ways uh, and structures. And if you know them, it can help you to understand the Bible better. So, for example, Paul's epistles. Um, if you read Paul's epistles, he has a, a methodology. He gives an introduction, you know, uh, of who he is. And if you know things like that, you'll understand the Bible better. The historical element, we need the historical element, looking at the history of a certain book or a certain passage of scripture can help immensely. Paul's epistles need to be read in, in, in the context of the book of Acts. Um, that's just one example. Yeah, The Psalms, so many of them can be read in the context of the life of David. Okay, historical context is important. 
theological element. We, we need to take the totality of what the scriptures teach on a certain topic when we're looking at a particular verse. So we need all these ways of looking at scripture. We need the Holy Spirit to help us. We need the grammatical side. We need to look at the grammar of the Greek and the Hebrew when we're studying a passage. We can use commentaries, lexicons to help us with that. We need the historic, the literary element, understand the structure of the book or the piece of literature that we're reading will help us immensely to understand a letter is not a poem and a poem is not a letter. Yeah. The historical element, looking at the historical background, for example, Ephesians, there's reference to, you know, when Paul writes to the letter to Ephesians, there's background in the book of Acts about him going to Ephesus. It helps us to understand the book of Ephesians. Uh, then you have the theological element. And in the theological element as well, there's something very important to note. That you take the totality of scripture, but also the Holy Spirit give, mean, give meaning to the scripture that even the writer didn't fully understand. And so we have to be open to that as well, theologically. So for example, Isaiah wrote things about the future Messiah that he didn't fully understand okay so just bear that in mind so we interpret scripture through with the holy spirit help we look at the grammar the greek grammar we look at the literary the historical and theological uh, aspects of a text okay so just saying i'm going to read my bible doesn't cut it you need to look at all these elements and have these elements it's like making a cake making a cake you need butter you need flour you need sugar you need it all to make that cake to interpret scripture you need the holy spirit but you need to look at the historical context of the text you need to look at the grammar of a text and the structure of a text the literary structure of the text and the theological foundation of the text where in other scriptures do we get this teaching or understanding okay so i hope that that's encouraged you to to take study seriously of the scripture okay don't despise the study of scripture don't be lazy in your study yeah read if you're going to preach on the book of romans teach on the book of romans read it once get to know that it's a letter and letters work in certain ways that will help you to understand the book of Romans, yeah, that's the literary understanding. But then if you're reading chapter 1, verse 16, find out the Greek of that verse. What's the Greek of it? Go and look at a lexicon. Go and look at Vine's dictionary. That, that, that's the grammar, the literary and then the grammar. Then the historical, what's the foundation? What is the historical background to the book of Romans? Well, you find a lot of the historical background at the end of the book. Because he mentions quite a few people and, and some issues that, that it was on his mind. So you have the grammatical, the literary, the historical, and then the theological. Where else is uh, it talking about justification by faith in Romans 16 and, and 17, for example? Uh, is it Romans 3, Galatians? Look at other scripture about the theological understanding. Of that passage you see and so you have to dig and all the time you're depending on the holy spirit you're depending on the holy spirit okay so i hope that's been edifying to you and challenged you and encouraged you don't be lazy in the study of scripture please the word of god is to be handled with great reverence and great respect but it must be handled with the holy spirit Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot understand Scripture. So be careful. Many of you out there have got books like I have, but you're depending on the rational mind and not de depending on the Holy Spirit. And you have to ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. But some of you, you, you depend on the Holy Spirit, but you will not study. And you know why you won't study? It, it's sheer arrogance, spiritual pride that you will not study. And you come up and say things that are not sound and not biblical because you will not take time to study the scripture. Paul said to Timothy, study to make yourself approved. 
We'll get we'll get it. Let's get it up. Yeah. Let's get it up. Study to make yourself. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 2 Timothy 2.15 2 Timothy 2.15 uh, 2 Study to make yourself approved of God. So that's the hermeneutic. So tonight we've done Tim Keller. We talked about theistic evolution. We've done Rudolf Bultmann, Bultmann and Van Til, the clash of Rudolf Bultmann and Van Til. We've, we've talked about that. And then we've looked at hermeneutics and the foundation of hermeneutics, the importance of hermeneutics. And now we're going to finish with a little bit of thought on the French Revolution. The French Revolution, why the French Revolution? What can we learn? From the French Revolution. I have some notes here. The old regime, the socio-political system which existed in most of Europe during the 18th centuries were ruled by absolutism, the monarch, had absolute control over the government. We're looking at the French Revolution and its implications for today. Okay. See, history repeats itself. Classes of people, privileged and underprivileged. Underprivileged people paid taxes and treated badly. Pri privileged people did not pay taxes and treated well. In France, people were divided into three estates. The first estate, high-ranking members of the church, privileged class. The second estate was the nobility and privileged class. The third estate, everyone else from peasants to countryside and wealthy merchants, bourgeoisie merchants. So the first estate is about 130,000 and they had privileges where they collected taxes they censored the press they controlled the education and uh, they were exempt from paying tax they brought down the morality they owned 20 percent of the land the second class the nobles uh, was about 110,000. they collected taxes in the form of feudal jews they paid no taxes and they supported the monarchy and the old regime then there was about 25 million of the peasant um and they paid all taxes and tithes to the church. Divine right of kings, the monarch ruled by divine right. God put the world in motion. God put some people in positions of power. Power is given by God. No one can question God. No one can question someone put in the power of God. And questioning the monarchy was blasphemy because it meant questioning God. So because of this, the king and the higher echelons of the leadership began to dominate and control the people in such a way that it became a burden to the people. Once economic economy was based primarily on agriculture. Peasant farmers of France bore the burden of taxation. Poor harvest meant that peasants had trouble paying their regular taxes. Bourgeoisie, middle class, often managed to gather wealth but were upset. They paid tax while nobles did not. France is bankrupt. The King Louis the Sixteenth lavished money on himself and residents like Versailles. Queen Marie, Marie Antoinette was seen as wasteful and a spender. Government found its funds depleted as a result of wars, including the funding of the American Revolution. Deficit spending, a government spending more money than it takes from tax revenues. Privileged classes would not submit to being taxed.
involved in this was the French Revolution in terms of philosophy, the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason. Scientists during the Renaissance have discovered laws that govern the natural world. Intellectuals, philosophies, began to ask if natural laws might also apply to human beings. Particular to human institutions such as governments, philosophies were secular in thinking. They used reason and logic rather than faith, religion, and superstition to answer important questions. Use reason and logic to determine how governments are formed. Long-term causes of the French Revolution. Absolutism, unjust social political system, poor harvest which left peasant farmers with little money for taxes, the influence of the Enlightenment philosophers, system of mercantilism which restricted trade, influence of other successful revolutions, the English Glorious Revolution of 1688, 1689, the American Revolution of 1775, 1783. I could go into more detail here, but I'm going to stop. Just to talk about the French Revolution. In the end, it descended into anarchy. There was four main periods during that revolution. Four main periods of where the new government that was trying to form and the issue with the king, in the end, the king got guillotined, uh, Marie Antoinette got guillotined, and uh, other royal family got persecuted, and um, in the end, the peasant third class rose to power. They ended up bringing in a reign of terror, uh, killing people, um, thousands of people, and uh, it descended into uh, anarchy in the end, the French Revolution. They had noble aims of making people equal, etc. So any thoughts about the French Revolution? There are many thoughts that we could have. And Rushduni um, has written a book on it. I've not read it, but a friend of mine's read it. It's specifically on the French Revolution. If anybody wants to look at it, you'll be, you know, you can go and do that. Some things that come to my mind about the French Revolution. The elites the king and his, his upper class were enjoying the fruits of the money, but they couldn't afford what they were doing. They were supporting foreign wars, and they were bleeding the ordinary people dry of the money, and the economy was collapsing. And there was supreme control over everybody. They couldn't be themselves. And I see a pattern today. You can see it in America and UK and the West, the authoritarianism, the absolutism is there like it was with, with Louis, King Louis and Antoinette and the elites, that absolutism. The financial deficit, you can see the economy of the West collapsing, uh, the deficit of America and UK and other Western countries is not sustainable. Thirdly, you can see that in the French Revolution, the working class couldn't survive. They couldn't pay the taxes because they had bad harvest uh, and it was too much for them. And you can see that today, that the ordinary people in the West are struggling to pay their bills. They're struggling. And yet more demands are, are being made for them. So you can see that inadvertently in the West, there's already the seeds of internal revolution there to come about where people will rebel and bring down the elites of today just like they brought down Antoinette and Louis, King Louis. So you can see a direct parallel from the French Revolution and today and some of the key issues of the French Revolution are being repeated today. High deficit, collapsing the economy, ordinary people can't pay their bills, the absolutism, it's all an ingredient for revolution in the West where people will rise up and rebel against their governments because the elites are enjoying themselves. They tell everybody else, you can't fly, you can't travel, you can't do this, you can't do that. And yet, and yet, 
they fly and they go and do the things that say, say we uh, that we can't do. John Mc drop out. Thank you, John. John's a, an atheist, but he's, a, he's someone I've known a long, long time, and he has some very, very thoughtful uh, thoughts to say. He, he has some very interesting thoughts. So thank you, John. So that, that's my little thought about the French Revolution. I was just reading tonight about the history of the French Revolution. I can give you some more facts and information if you want it, but uh, I would encourage you to read the history of the French Revolution and think about our own times, and you can see some parallels. John's saying there's differences, of course, there are. The church was more in power in those days, and, and those who rose up took sought to take power from the church. So that, that's one difference. The church is not in power today as it was then. But in, in France, it was the Catholic Church. So, yeah. So, I've finished. I'm going to send in the link here. Maybe someone wants to come on. So, I'll give you an opportunity if anyone wants to come on just for a minute. So, I've finished now. I've done my talking. I've talked about the French Revolution. I've talked about hermeneutics. I've talked about Rudolf Bultmann and Van Til. I've talked about theistic evolution and the issue of Tim Keller. So there's nothing more for me to say tonight. I've put out the link if anybody wants to come on and to share some thoughts. So over to you. Like I said, God willing, I'll be in UK to see my mum uh, soon. Keep me in prayer. What are you saying there, John? There is an entire tier of humanity that operate under different values and assumptions than the rest of us, and we really should start to acknowledge and address, address it. Yes, definitely, John. <clears throat> I totally agree about that. I totally agree. There is something going on that's very sinister. That's a good point. The yellow jackets in France. But we, we, we are heading in this realm of absolute authoritarianism from our governments. They've moved away from democracy, far, far away from democracy today. And in my time, I'm shocked that the last couple of years, especially how this authoritarianism has come about, this absolutism has come about, and these elites enjoying all the fruits of their money and everything, and yet everybody else has to they, you know, they're bringing in these 15-minute barriers in, in towns and cities so you can't travel. Uh, you know, we, we went through the lockdown requirements and free speech, you get counselled every time you say your opinion. Um, and we're seeing this absolutism, authoritarianism. We're seeing the collapse in the economy. Um, it, it's not sustainable. We see people struggling to pay bills and so we can see that the elites will get their comeuppance because at the end of the day they can't live the way they're living they can't afford it because they're promoting foreign wars for example ukraine they'll run out of money they'll run out of gas and people will get sick of it and rebel uh, and, and bring down these governments that's what happened in the french revolution So I put the link there. I 
put it again if anyone wants to come on. Thank you for um, Hastings and John McDropout for sharing the thoughts there. Thank you. Very interesting thoughts. There's the link. Got a chance to come on. I've done my part. I've done what I had to come and do. So I'm going to go in a minute. If you want to come on, the, the link is there to come on live. I'm going to go in any minute now. So if you want to come on, you can come now. Ah, Jeremy, hope you are okay, bro. Nice to hear. Long time no see, Jeremy. God bless. The old guard have come from the old days. Uh, okay, guys. I'm going to go in a minute. So there's lots to think about on this video. Different things for different people. So I'm going to go, keep us in prayer, keep my mum in prayer. Those who don't know, she's very sick. She's, uh, she's not got long to live, so please keep her in prayer. I'll be going to see her and spend time with her and my family. So please keep my wife in prayer, daughters and the children here and everything. And thank you for all your support. Those who've helped us and prayed for us and been behind us. I know there's been quite a few, there's quite a few people who, who donate anonymous, anonymously. One person in particular, I, I can't thank them enough. And uh, people have supported us and encouraged us and helped us. So I really appreciate that. So God bless you. And I'm going to go. We're closing prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your love. And we give you the praise and the glory. And we just pray that you bless your word and bless this time together. Bless families represented here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go. John's just sent the last message. All right, John, thank you for your love, bro. And uh, thanks, John Madama. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so God bless you, folks. I'm going to go. Enjoy the video. There's lots in here to study and listen to. Uh, so take care. God bless. Bye.